this is just for the recording, I presume. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll make a I'll make a note of to keep my mouth on. It's hard to tell when uh, there's no speaker. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. My name is Paul Poy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Edge. Uh, we are a non-custodial exchange and security platform. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about a theory uh, I have uh, about exchanges, the word wallet, and where we are today versus what I think you're going to start seeing over the next several years into the future. And I am positing the theory that effectively, this is actually a continuation of the last question that Tim had asked about how we'll see integration of, of wallets and exchanges. And I'm positing a theory that in the future, wallets are your exchange. They are going to be the exchanges that you interface with. They are going to be the brands that you will recognize when you want to create or use exchange services. And if anything, the word wallet has become almost bastardized by the cryptocurrency world. If you ask yourself what you thought of was a wallet prior to cryptocurrency, it was a physical thing, portable, sat in your pocket, and it was purposed for holding some funds that would, you would use for spending. In the world of cryptocurrency, it means many different things. It could be a digital version of exactly that leather wallet. It could be the account that sits in a fully centralized exchange that custodies your money. In the past, that was just simply a bank account, but now exchanges call that a wallet. It could be a browser that effectively runs multiple independent applications and can interface signing and creating transactions for a blockchain. Or it effectively could be a non-custodial exchange. It has many different definitions. And so while there's many of wallets, many wallets in the industry, each kind of serve a bit of a different purpose. But from the viewpoint of the exchange, I'm fairly confident you'll see that they are going to be your exchanges of the future. So looking at exchanges, they have definitely, in the cryptocurrency world, had all of the love. They generate a good amount of the volume. They've had a lot of the investments. You know, look at most of the large venture capitalists that have invested in cryptocurrency and companies. A vast majority of their investments have gone towards exchanges. Very little have gone into what people consider wallets, the non-custodial key management solutions that sit on your own device. But alongside that love, they've, uh, well, second slide about the love, they've definitely also generated a lot of the traction, the volume. Tons of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies flow through these centralized exchanges. And this is a, a pretty classic example of why they achieve so much attention and also why they get a lot of the investment. But as mentioned pr prior, they also get a lot of the hate. There are causes a lot of loss of cryptocurrency. This is nothing new. You know, people are aware of this. It's just one of those things you have. You, you have to bite the bullet. They're a, ne a necessary evil in our industry. <clears throat> and so this is an incomplete slide I think it as soon as I make it it's out of date you know a new exchange gets hacked and you know the numbers grow and uh, in essence I think this is nearly an unsolvable problem um, in the sense that you're trying to take a, a, a digital bearer asset one that's nearly fully anonymous and secure it uh, in a central authority that as it grows more value is being held in that central authority, and therefore they have to hire more people that need to be trusted to store those assets, which makes it even harder to trust those people. So the growing value um, in these authorities makes it much, much harder to solve the problem of kind of centralized custody. <clears throat> and so if you wanted to have your own custody, and people say, not your keys, not your coin, what does that experience look like? What does the UX look like? Well, first you gotta go figure out how to use what's kind of called a normal send and receiving wallet and how to create and, and back up those keys. And some are easier, some are harder. We'd like to think we've built an easier solution, but either way, you've just gotta do that. Then you gotta go and actually register with an exchange, usually a, a separate application, a different website, a different service. Then you've gotta go and place your order. Uh, and Usually, even before this, I skipped a whole step. You've got to go and deposit money into it. And that sometimes takes a while. Even if it's crypto that you're depositing into it, you might have to wait one, two, three confirmations. Once that happens, you go in and place your order. I've got to add that. That's like a whole other step that I missed out on. Place that order and wait for that order to settle. And depending on the order type, that could take a while or it might not ever happen. Then go back to your external wallet whether hardware, software, paper, and copy an address, and then go back into the exchange, paste it to withdraw. This is effectively what you have to go through to 
have your keys and have your coin as someone that interfaces with a normal centralized exchange. But the key is it doesn't have to be this way. And this is where the wallet really becomes the exchange. This, actually as an example, this now is what is deemed the easier solution. Not quite there, but I think Tim had mentioned uh, a shapeshift solution, where you have a website that you just simply send crypto and crypto comes back out. This is kind of the instant exchanges. But even then, you're having to create this order, and it's kind of small for most of you in the audience, so I'll kind of let, let, you, let you know what's happening here. Someone wants to turn Stellar into Ether. That should be simple, send some Stellar, receive some Ether. But that process requires copying and pasting two addresses and what Stellar calls a memo. So you've got three different pieces of data that you have to copy and paste and then scan a QR code to send money to this website before you receive back your funds. So this is still, while still an instant in exchange, and in, in many cases it eliminates the registration process, it's still fairly tedious when you deal with a separate exchange versus one that's integrated. Now from the viewpoint of it actually getting integrated into a wallet, that's where we see the user experience excel, where you've created the keys, you've, you've backed up the keys of a, a wallet, whether mobile, desktop, whatnot, and now that can present to you the interface to do an exchange. And the nice thing about keys, keys are, are admittedly tough to deal with, but once you've deal, dealt with keys and you have keys that are secured, they can actually help you get into a centralized service. They can authenticate you into a centralized service. They can actually replace the password, which is one of the most friction parts of every new account. You deal with it for a private key for crypto, it eliminates the need for that with your centralized exchange. So you still KYC as normal. But when you go to purchase, you just specify how much you want. And funds can go out of the bank and go directly into your non-custodial platform, your wallet. There's no copying and pasting. There's no scanning of QR codes. It just happens integrated inside of the same app. As well, if you're doing crypto to crypto, that, that second exchange example I gave where you're doing Stellar to, I think it was Ether, and having to copy and paste multiple addresses and a memo and scanning of a QR code, that can be made entirely invisible. You specify how much XRP to Monero you want, you get a quote, and off it goes. And there's no interface with two different parties. <coughs> And so it's good to be a wallet in this ecosystem for multiple reasons. Obviously, a centralized exchange has a huge need for a lot of regulatory burden. Right? They deal with what does it mean when you hold other people's money. Governments don't like that, so there are a lot of rules. Uh, banking relationships, if you do fiat conversion, then you have to deal with the banks because they don't like crypto. It's a lot of rubbing, rubbing elbows with the right people. Um, and a thing that a lot of people forget, too, is that Software, wallets are software, exchanges are financial services. Software can be global. Global, Financial services generally can't. Even the biggest banks in the world, name, someone name the biggest bank you can think of. JP Morgan. I can name probably five countries they're not available in. You could probably easily think of five countries, and there's way many more. It's just not worth their time to go into a lot of some of the smaller countries. It's too hard, it's too much work. Try finding a country that Google isn't available in, or Facebook. And it's not because it's too hard for them to get there. Usually it's because of disagreement with government policy. But they could easily be there because they're software. And it's the difference between software and financial services. So it can be global. You can, able, you can serve the world. Um, being in the software arena allows you to also to achieve redundancy of providers of exchange services. So it's good to be in this space. And I think what you're going to find is some of the best players and the biggest names for exchange services sit actually at the software layer versus sitting at the uh, provider labor layer. And since the topic of the day is about DEXs, how does this interface with this concept? As DEXs start to grow, when people, one thing people sometimes forget about is that every DEX is really a wallet, or it needs one. Every wallet, in a way, is a dApp. You know, a decentralized application. It si creates and signs transactions and sends it on to the blockchain. And every dApp effectively is a wallet in that it creates transactions for our blockchain. 
Some have their own key manager, some don't. But as DEXs grow, so will the need for these software solutions that hold and transact with keys, which in today's day we call wallets. I bring up the concept of the Lightning Network with respect to exchanges because um, it's a much talked about topic. It's highly, highly debated on its utility. Like, will it work in the future? Will it help scale? Um, I think that's undecided yet. I'm not, I don't subscribe to the opinion that it definitively, based on the technology as it stands today, will be a scaling solution for us to pay. But the one way that it can actually f fit nicely is to implement cross-chain exchange, allowing people to go from two chains that can support the Lightning Network more or less seamlessly. You still have the experience of depositing into the exchange, but you're depositing into a non-custodial solution and in fact, effectively doing atomic swaps um, via technology similar to the Lightning Network. But once again, in order to interface with that, you've got to hold your keys. You've got to have a solution for that. And that's where the existing quote-unquote wallets come into play. And that software layer can tie all of these solutions together. You say what you want to exchange. If it's fiat, it's probably going to have to go through the centralized partner. That's fine. If it's crypto to crypto, it might go through a semi-centralized partner like a Shapeshifter Changely. Um, if it's maybe an obscure coin, it goes through a DEX. And maybe if it's crypto to crypto and it's through uh, a solution uh, or chains that can support Lightning, maybe it goes through there. But really, these wallets are the exchanges, are the ones that can really interface across all of the solutions and effectively deliver you the best solution for what you're trying to trade. So quick little presentations might get a little technical. How many people here are developers? Two, three. So I'll try to breeze through this really quick. Um, one of the challenges of uh, integration between a wallet and an exchange is that communication layer and of, of being able to say, hey, how do I authenticate a user? How do I make that copy and pasting of an address invisible? So we built an, an open API that any wallet or exchange can implement, and we welcome them to, to make this interface much, seem, much more seamless and help eliminate the need for the retail investor from ever having to touch a centralized exchange. And it does effectively four, I'll talk about three things, which is authenticate the user, request the wallet to send money to the exchange, and request an address from the exchange. And really, after that, you're integrated. right? You get the same experience as if you went straight to an exchange or website. Um, so a tiny bit of code, one call from the website that is the exchange running inside of a wallet can make one one call that says, give me an address. I want to send you money. Your user just asked to buy some Bitcoin, and I want to send it to you. One line of code, and you can get an address from the wallet. Spend money. Hey, Mr. Wallet, your user just wanted to sell Bitcoin or whatever crypto. Please send some money to this address, and the user confirms it. <clears throat> Last. This one's a tiny bit more complicated. You want to authenticate a user. Remember I mentioned once you figure out how to store and secure private keys, well, that can replace the password. Well, a wallet is effectively a key manager. Well, can you please store some data for me, like a username and an authentication token, like a password? Um, that way the user doesn't have to enter it again the next time they come to the site and retrieve that username and password or authentication token and automatically authenticate them into the service. So you can get this seamless user flow from when the user enters into this exchange service, registers, re-enters into it in the future, buys or sells. Um, <clears throat> so this is effectively what we built in our own application. Like I said, that API is open. We invite anyone else, if you know any other projects that are building uh, effectively wallets that want to be able to integrate with exchanges. We've, we've uh, actually got multiple partners that are implementing this on the exchange side. And so even to potentially our detriment, we'd be happy to see other competitors implement this because it's going to get more people off the centralized exchanges and into the non-custodial solutions, which is really what we want to see. Um, so our own app is a mobile app for, for iOS and Android, um, and it supports a plethora of cryptocurrencies, more coming. Um, our key management is probably our differentiator. We make it where people never have to see 12 or 24 words. You plug in a username and password, and keys are created, backed up, uh, synchronized and two-factored password recovery and all of that. And the inter 
Exchange is integrated. You know, the screenshots you saw earlier were from our own app. So you say what crypto you want, crypto to crypto, it does it for you. Never have to see an address. Same thing with fiat to crypto through uh, various partners that we have. <coughs> um, and these are some of the partners that are kind of coming on board and sign up to do various exchange services, both for us and you know, I see other companies as well integrating them. But uh, it's nice to kind of make friends, not enemies, you know, actually partner with different companies in different regions and leave them to the expertise of their regions, something that we can't be good at. And we want to focus on software. They can focus on a lot of those banking partnerships. Uh, one example of a great partner that we, uh, we have, um, Biddy, they work out of Europe and they're, able to f and they're going to be able to provide um, fiat to crypto with no KYC at five grand a day. That's the kind of thing. We can't rub enough elbows to do that, being a US-based company. You know, but we'd rather partner with those people than try to do it ourselves. Um, actually, along those lines, uh, Stratum, CoinBR, they're out of Brazil, and they can do no KYC as well, fully compliant in, in their region. <clears throat> so really reducing the friction, and we get to benefit from that. So a quick closing thought uh, about this concept of wallets are the exchange. I'm not sure, maybe this is dating me, but in the early era of the internet, like the mid 90s, the hot startups of the internet were literally ISPs. These two are some of the hottest that I had heard of at home in COVID, at least being in California in the US. They're like, oh man, they're delivering internet to you. And if you look at some of the challenges they faced, they faced three key challenges. Um, it was hard for them to grow outside of a very specific region. They were locked to their region, what that they supported. Number two, they dealt heavily with regulation, a lot of telco regulation. Um, and number three, they had to beg the incumbents for access to the existing infrastructure. Effectively, that's the exact same problem centralized exchanges have. All three. And they're also the hot startups of cryptocurrency. They get all the attention, they get a lot of the funding, but I posit that in 10 to 15 years, those companies, while those products will exist, like we still need ISPs today, they're very important. We're, for a long time, gonna need exchanges, they're very important. They won't be the household names, they won't be the global names that you'll remember or will be relevant in 15 years. And if anything, I would predict that the current incumbents will just do their job and potentially eat them up. Some will be fortunate to get bought out, some won't be and will just get squashed. But the companies that will stay around and actually be known, much like in the internet era, era are the software companies that sit on top of that layer versus the ones that try to deal with the legacy systems. And that's the theory that I'm effectively proposing for you right now. And we'll see whether or not that happens in a few years. Thanks a lot.